Hey, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here for week two of our series uh, on the mouth. Imagine playing in four consecutive Super Bowls. That's an amazing accomplishment. Imagine losing all four games. That was the painful reality endured by the Buffalo Bills and their fans in the early 1990s. My daughter married a guy from Buffalo who was not even alive when that happened, but it hurts him to talk about it as if he lived through it. After that fourth consecutive Super Bowl loss, Hall of Fame running back Thurman Thomas was seated on the Bills bench with his head in his hands. Why? Because it's tough to lose a Super Bowl and because his three fumbles contributed to the loss to the Cowboys. At a moment when Thurman Thomas could not have felt worse about his own play, he looked up and saw legendary Cowboys running back Emmett Smith, who had just been named the game's MVP. Emmett was holding his goddaughter as Thurman glanced up from the bench. They'd already spoken on the field. Now Emmett was approaching him again. What would he say? Emmett said to his goddaughter, Honey, I want you to meet Mr. Thurman Thomas, the greatest running back in the NFL. Some of you know that Emmett Smith went on to gain more rushing yards than any player in NFL history. But on a day when many would say he was entitled to proud words, he spoke humble words, generous words, the kind of words that Paul described in Philippians 2 when he wrote, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. How do we do that? We do it primarily with our words. We're in a series of sermons on the mouth. Last week, we defined upwards, words that not only pass the test of truth, but also pass the test of of goodness and helpfulness. This week, I want to focus on what I'm calling downwards, which are not words we use to speak down to other people, but humble words. Jesus said something that is both a principle for us to live by and a warning for us. He said, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So you, you and I have an important choice to make. We can identify with Jesus by speaking humble words, or we can put ourselves in line for God's punishment if we speak proud words and neglect humble words. I think there's an Old Testament king that can help us get a handle on this today, not through his positive example as much as his negative example. The Old Testament book of Daniel is a unique book in the Bible because even though it's a book about part of Israel's history, it is actually set in a different country in Babylon. Babylon had conquered Israel and had taken many of the Jews back to Babylon as slaves. They did the same thing throughout the known world in the 6th century BC. So Babylon was a huge, powerful empire. They literally ruled the world. And all that power, all that dominance produced a, a lot of pride especially for King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. No one was more powerful. No one was richer than he was. No one's palace and surroundings could match the beauty of Nebuchadnezzar's hanging gardens, which are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But even though God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to conquer Israel in order to discipline them, God was not finished with Israel. He continued to bless those who were faithful to him, and they continued to worship him even while they were in exile in Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar's pride eventually led him to desire a promotion. And when you're already the king of everything, you only have so many things you can do in order to have a promotion. So Nebuchadnezzar declared himself God. He built a massive statue in honor of himself, and he summoned leaders from throughout his empire, and he gave a simple command, bow down to the statue that represents me or die. Now, for most of them, that was a pretty easy choice. Expediency won out, and they worshiped the statue. But for the Hebrews that were among the king's advisors, this was a huge problem. They all knew the Ten Commandments, the first of which was no other gods, the second of which was no idols, no images. And there was no fine print that read, except when your life is on the line. 
So they couldn't worship the statue, even though they did not want to disrespect Nebuchadnezzar. Now, time won't allow us to walk through the entire story today, but suffice it to say that the weasels among the king's advisors made sure the king knew that the Hebrews were not bowing down and worshiping the statue that represented him, and that made the king furious. How dare they? And in his pride and anger, the king had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into a blazing furnace. Fortunately, God stepped in and saved them. And when it was all over, King Nebuchadnezzar actually praised God and made it illegal to speak against the God of the Bible, which seems like progress. But apparently the progress was temporary because in the next chapter, chapter 4 of Daniel, God warns Nebuchadnezzar to submit his spirit to God. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar tells us about it in his own words, which makes this a fascinating and unique passage. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. But one night, I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order, calling in all the wise men of Babylon, so they could tell me what my dream meant. Well, in his dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw a massive tree that was visible to the entire world. The tree was loaded with fruit, and many birds made that tree home. There were wild animals that found shade and nourishment under the tree. But in the king's dream, an angel comes down from heaven and orders that the tree be cut down and its branches be cut off, leaving only the roots and a stump. And there was also a warning that someone would be given the mind of an animal for a period of time. When the king finished describing the dream, Daniel was there to interpret it for him, and he was so shaken by the content of the dream, he couldn't speak to the king. But the king urged Daniel not to be afraid to interpret the dream for him, so Daniel did it. The tree in the dream was, as you would guess, it was Nebuchadnezzar. He had become exceedingly great. His kingdom was seen and known by the entire world. Everyone on earth knew who King Nebuchadnezzar was. But because of his arrogance and his unwillingness to submit to God, God was taking away his kingdom and would drive him into the wilderness where he he would live like an animal for a period of time. That was the really bad news. The good news was that it did not have to be final. In the middle of verse 25, Daniel explains, seven periods of time will pass while you live this way. Some scholars think that means seven years. Some think it just means seven is kind of the biblical number for completion. So when this time is complete, when you've completely learned your lesson, until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses... But the stump and roots of the tree were left in the ground. And this means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. So God is bringing this judgment on King Nebuchadnezzar, but it doesn't have to be final. And God is giving him a choice. If Nebuchadnezzar repents of his pride and he stops portraying himself as a God and demanding that people worship him, then God is willing to restore him. And that's why Daniel concludes his comments in verse 27 by saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. Now, some of you hear the part of these verses that talks about God's judgment against Nebuchadnezzar, and you think, yep, that's the God of the Old Testament, punishing wicked people, having no mercy. But I disagree. Because when I read this warning that God sent to King Nebuchadnezzar, I can't help but marvel at how much mercy there is, at how much grace God is extending to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, even though you've done horrible things, even though you have tried to take the place of God, and even though you've abused and even killed people, I will place you back in a role of authority if you will just acknowledge that I am the one who has given you this kingdom. He offers a second chance to this tyrant. That's a level of grace that's beyond imagination, and that's the God of the Old Testament. So if you've ever heard the God of the Old Testament 
is all about judgment. God of the New Testament is all about grace. And it's hard for you to figure that out. That's just an oversimplification. It's a misrepresentation because God has always been about forgiveness and grace and second chances. But like so many people, Nebuchadnezzar hears God's offer and ignores it. Verse 28 of Daniel 4. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. As he looked out across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. Nebuchadnezzar needed a mom like actor Denzel Washington's mother. After Denzel's career took off, he went home once and he was talking about all the good things happening for him as an actor, but he didn't offer any credit or thanks to the people who had helped him succeed. His mother did not like his attitude, and so she said, oh, you did it all by yourself? I'll tell you what you can do by yourself. You can go outside with that mop and that bucket and you can clean these windows by yourself. You can do that by yourself, superstar. <laughs> and he did. God reminded Nebuchadnezzar that he is the one who appoints rulers and grants them success. But what do Nebuchadnezzar's words reveal? That he thinks it's all him, his self-sufficiency. You think Nebuchadnezzar ever lifted a hammer to build that magnificent city? Not once. And yet he couldn't acknowledge the people below him in authority who were responsible or the God above him in authority. Nebuchadnezzar is like someone who receives an Academy Award or an Oscar and stands up and says, I'd like to thank myself. Thank me very much. That's Nebuchadnezzar. President Teddy Roosevelt never wanted to be like that. He loved the outdoors, so it's no surprise that when he hosted world leaders and diplomats at the White House, he would often close the evening by inviting them to walk outside with him. And after a moment of casual conversation, Roosevelt would become very quiet and he would just begin looking up at the stars. After an awkward few moments, and it is awkward when suddenly there's no conversation, his guests would begin to join him and they would lift their eyes and they would begin to gaze at the stars. And Roosevelt would allow that to happen for several minutes. And after a while, he would say, well, gentlemen, I believe we're all small enough now. Let's get some rest. That's the opposite of King Nebuchadnezzar's self-congratulating spirit, self-worshipping spirit. And that's why verse 31 says, while these words were still in his mouth, this great city that I have built, it's for my splendor. A voice called down from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. For a year, God had given Nebuchadnezzar an opportunity to heed the warning in the dream. Daniel had interpreted the dream for him, told him what it meant, and challenged him to surrender himself to God. But Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't do it. So God kept his word, as God always does. God keeps his promises. God keeps his warnings. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, every word of God proves true. If you're like me, there are some words in the Bible that you love. They're the words you post on your social media. They're the words that you have on some kind of plaque or, or, or sign or piece of art in your home the words that you love, and most of those words are promises, things that God promises, and those words are true. But maybe we should spend more time thinking about the verses that are not our favorites, the Bible verses that challenge us in ways that we're uncomfortable being challenged, Bible verses that ask things of us that we don't really want to give in our humanity. Maybe those are the things that we should focus on most 
because every word of God will prove true. Nebuchadnezzar's proud words were easy to recognize. Look what I did. Look who I am. Look how much power and wealth I have. I'm great and I have no one to thank but myself. But not all of our prideful words are so obvious, so blatant. I want us to spend a few minutes highlighting some kinds of words that are really pride in disguise. One is insisting on credit. I don't know about you, but it is tough for me to stay humble and to stay quiet when I think someone is overlooking my contribution or when I think someone else is claiming credit for my idea or my work. And I would say the same thing that a lot of you would say about all the things we're gonna talk about over the next few minutes. I don't do that all the time. Okay, there's no sin that we do all the time. The problem is when we do it at all. I've caught myself making sure other people know that I'm responsible for that good thing that they noticed. But when we are growing in humility, rather than clamoring for credit, we look for ways to share credit, we look for ways to elevate others, and we allow the good things we do to glorify God. After all, how original are we anyway? When have you or I ever solved a problem without using the mind that God gave us, without employing the education poured into us by other people? When have we ever earned a dollar outside of the opportunity that God has given us to work within a functional, growing economy? Aren't there a lot of people in the world who work as hard, maybe even harder than many of us who can barely survive because they do not have the blessing of an economic environment that rewards them? When have we ever contributed money that God didn't provide for us first? When have we ever served with our hands or gone somewhere with our feet that we didn't use the limbs and the body that God gave to us? When have we ever voiced an insight from, that didn't come from God's word or from God's spirit? When have I ever preached a sermon or made a salient point that didn't come from God? When have we ever received forgiveness that we deserved? No wonder James wrote, every good and perfect gift is from above. It's from the Father above. If you really think that you're the one who's making all of your own breaks, if you really think that the love that you're showing to other people is something that you are generating out of yourself alone or out of thin air, you just haven't looked deep enough. You just haven't traced the roots of your success or your love or your goodness far enough, far enough to see they actually tie back to God. You and I haven't acquired anything good. We haven't done anything good. We haven't said anything good that didn't begin with God somehow. If there is a glimmer of good in you or a glimmer of good in me, he is the source of it. And that is why it is not wrong. And that is why it is only right for us to give him glory. And the fact that we have to remind ourselves of this is just more evidence of how true it is. Another form of pride can be our religious lingo. Now, this is a tough one. Because there are some legitimate spiritual words that ought to be spoken. And those words convey our love for God or our devotion to God. The Bible actually encourages us to speak words like that. But it also warns us against speaking those words for some kind of dark or selfish motive. All those words come with a temptation because... It is possible to employ spiritual sounding words to say spiritual things in a way that is designed to elevate us rather than God. Saying to someone, I'll pray for you, when most of the time after saying it, you don't pause and intentionally pray for that person is really a way of pretending to have a spiritual practice or spiritual credentials 
that we don't really have. The Apostle Paul said that he and his co-workers for Christ made a pledge to never use spiritual words deceptively or in self-serving ways. That's an impossible commitment to keep 100% of the time, but it is an important commitment for us to make an attempt to keep. Another kind of proud speech is self-justification. You ever do that? Done that yet today? When a religious scholar asked Jesus, what do I need to be saved by God? Jesus pointed him back to the Old Testament law. The man was a Jewish scholar after all. He knew the law of God forward and backward. Why did he need Jesus to answer a question that is plainly answered in the scriptures that he'd studied all of his life? So Jesus turned the question back to him and the man answered his own question correctly. He said, the law requires that I love God and I love the people God created. And Jesus affirmed, your answer is right. Now comes the tough part. Do it. Luke 10, 29 offers some insight into the words the man spoke to Jesus next. It says, he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and just who is my neighbor? A seemingly innocent question, but Jesus knew the heart condition behind that question. The man wanted to narrow the definition of neighbor so that his obligation to love other people would be diminished. Justifying ourselves is a way of refusing to acknowledge our sin or the consequences of our sin. It's hoping that we'll be acquitted on a technicality rather than aspiring to fully obey God's commands and principles. We justify ourselves by citing extenuating circumstances. And sometimes there are other circumstances, but sometimes the circumstances we cite are simply an excuse. Or we highlight someone else's wrongdoing because we want to draw attention, attention away from our own wrongdoing. We compare our sin to someone else's because we want to escape God's high expectations of us. Pride also reveals itself in the harsh judgment of others. If you're someone who knows what is right and is a little proud that you know what is right, this is a temptation for you. One of Jesus' most poignant teachings was an account of two men who went to the temple at the same time to pray. One was a self-righteous religious leader. The other was a tax collector who really lacked spiritual confidence. One assumed he had excellent standing with God. The other wasn't sure that God would even want to accept him. The religious leader thanked God that he was not like the thieves and the adulterers and the tax collectors referring to the man nearby. But the tax collector prayed from the back of the room and wouldn't lift his eyes to even look in God's direction. And he humbly prayed, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Let's read that together. God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. That shouldn't feel awkward to us. That shouldn't feel forced to us. That should be our posture before God. And Jesus said only one of those men went home from the temple that day justified. And we know which one it is. What a warning that is to those of us who are tempted to believe that we somehow, for some reason, hold a higher spiritual rank than other people. You know, a more subtle form of proud words is our words of self-pity. Now, that sounds like the opposite of pride, doesn't it? But degrading ourselves is not the same as confessing our sins and our faults. Self-shaming is sometimes an indication that we are self-obsessed and sometimes with superficial things. Comparing ourselves unfavorably to other people can eventually become failing to accept how God has created us or how God has gifted us. It sounds odd, but insecurity is just an inverted form of pride. If God so loves you that he gave his only son, 
then should you despise yourself if he loves you that much? Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, and he is, who can ever be against us? If he did not spare even his own son but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who then will condemn us? No one, including ourselves. We should not condemn ourselves. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not really sure if it originated with him, but C.S. Lewis is attributed a famous quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. You don't have to disparage yourself to be humble. You need to be transparent about your sin. You need to admit when you're wrong. You need to acknowledge your imperfection easily. But you don't have to trash yourself. You just have to stop obsessing over yourself. If there is such a thing as healthy pride, it is agreeing with what God says about you. And God says you are loved with an everlasting love. Chan Gailey was a retired football coach until a couple of weeks ago when he was coaxed back into the game by the Miami Dolphins who want him to be their offensive coordinator. Gailey's career has taken him back and forth between professional and college football. He spent time with the Cowboys, Chiefs, Bills, Jets. He coached Georgia Tech to some bowl game victories, though he never beat the Georgia Bulldogs, which is the one measure of success if you're a coach at Georgia Tech. Years ago, Gailey was in his second year as head coach of Troy State in Alabama, a team that was just a few days away from winning the Division II NCAA championship in football. As he walked out of his office toward the practice field, his assistant said, Coach, you have a phone call. And without even making eye contact, he asked her to take a message. But she replied, Coach, it's Sports Illustrated. Gailey stopped in his tracks, turned around, walked toward his office, closed the door, and took a deep breath so that he would sound composed when he answered the phone. When he picked up the phone and said hello, the person on the other end of the call said, is this Chan Gailey? This is Coach Gailey, he said. And the voice replied, sir, your Sports Illustrated subscription is about to lapse. <clears throat> so can I tell you about our special renewal rate? Life is exactly as Jesus said. This is why Jesus told us. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves and who reflect it through their humble words will be exalted. I don't know about you, but even though there are things about this world's exaltation that are sometimes attractive, I'm ready to trade it. I'm ready to trade it for whatever exaltation Jesus wants to give to me because I know it will be better and purer and eternal. And if that means humbling myself now, God, give me the grace and show me the way to do it.